Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's episode, you have to keep evolving and growing with Naomi Woods. We talk about the missed opportunity of the apprenticeship levy for leadership development, how food manufacturing is taken for granted, and everyone needs support to grow and develop, but they also have to want to. Naomi has a passion for supporting people to flourish and grow at work, building personal and organisational capability that sticks. Her business, Mayoni Consulting Limited, delivers that purpose primarily through organisational and leadership development. Naomi's experience is varied, having done operational roles before stepping into people and organisation development and working in the FMCG engineering and education sectors. Naomi's current focus is on continuing to support organisations to develop and enable their leaders in this time of uncertainty and daily change. Personally, she is growing her capability to deliver flexible and virtual people development. The ILM Level 3 and 5 apprenticeship programmes are already seeing the benefit of staying connected and learning with the real-life challenges that currently exist. So Michelle and I are on the road again today. We are in Darlington. Is it me, Michelle? Like Every time we're down this way, Darlington, Teesside, Stockton. Stockton, it's always sunny. It's weird, isn't it? It is lovely today. I don't understand that. But we bring the sun. It's like... Here comes sunny the capital sun. of the world. Da, 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 da. <laughs> you have to come so, more often. <laughs> so, blustery sunny day in Darlington. Let's kick off, shall we, Naomi? With uh, let's go back to childhood. Okay. Did you know what you wanted to be? I really wanted to be a ballerina, as all little girls did of the kind of of that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and because uh, I knew right that uh, there I could be a ballerina, I could be a doctor, I could be a nurse, I could be a teacher, I could mm-hmm. be a vet. That was kind of the horizons that I had at mm-hmm. that point. And as I kind of went along to my ballet classes um, and I worked really hard, one day Mrs. Rouse. I said to her that I want to be a ballerina and she told me that my bottom was too big and that it was just never really going to happen. I had the same thing, but it was because I was developing boobies. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so kind of them. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, and you just go, so I've carried that one with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so then I decided, right, okay, so what was I going to do? Mm-hmm. And my parents were always quite... Um, like do what do what you want to do like whatever you want to do do what you want to do and within their sphere and their kind of context were quite good role models in terms of you know my mum you know we used to go back they used to go back to work uh, kind of stop working sorry and you didn't go back to work and you stayed at home and there were three of us and you definitely stayed at home if you had three children at that mm. age and my mum always worked always did something always had something that was for her so mm-hmm. I thought well if I can't be a ballerina which would be like your stereotypical female thing what shall I do I'll be an engineer of course so I went to the what you know if I was going to be different what could that be mm-hmm. and I've always had a real thing about a uh, real polarity in my personality about being different and doing things differently whilst also not being so crazy and different so I would never do anything like dye my hair crazy colors Mm -hmm. but actually I wouldn't necessarily follow the current fashion about how you should have your hair Mm. because I just like to be different and I've got red hair anyway so it's always going to be a bit stand a bit of a standout Mm -hmm. I figured out I was going to be an engineer so I worked really hard in my GCSEs I knew that I was going to do my A-levels maths English and physics ouch I know right tough yeah first year of a school that did sixth form the first time they did it maths teacher who was not all that great mm. uh, science teacher who didn't know what to do with girls because he did only ever taught <laughs> at boys school wonderful <laughs> so I had a quite a rookie r- kind of rough time and needless to say uh, my A level maths was only made it to an AS level mm. during this journey I had figured out that I was not going to be an engineer because my maths was not good enough so I applied for a very vocational kind of engineering and business degree that I could do something else with mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I got a BSc in on this uh, and that's what I was going to do. And then I decided that I would be in manufacturing because mm-hmm. that was quite practical, right? And pragmatic and different. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd got an opportunity to go and see a factory making um, 
tomato, I mean, making tomato ketchup into those little pots. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fascinating I stuff. Love even watching those, how how things are made in the factories. Mm. It's just fascinating, isn't it? The, exactly. the machinery, how it all works together, like magic. Yeah. Yep. So that bit really kind of caught me. So I decided that that was what I was going to do then. So I was going to lead people and manage people who make really pragmatic, sensible things. Mm. Um, there are a few other bits in between there to get to that point, but decided that I was going to do. Started on the shop floor on a graduate scheme, managing 50 people, two different shifts, um, and making sandwiches for Marks and Spencers. Cool. Yeah, like one of the best jobs and one of the worst jobs I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, you're just like 22 thinking, oh my God, these people, like I like people, I know people, I generally am quite empathetic, mm. I get them, this is brilliant. I've been told this week that uh, I'm racist. Uh, uh, somebody has tried to clock for their twin brother. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've had such and such as mom from the other line come and say that I've not paid their son correctly. You know, like real baptism of fire. How mm. do you deal with him? And let's mm-hmm. let's put that into context. My lines were really lovely. There were some real people on there who really looked out for me and really looked after me. Some awesome people too. Mm. Um, just not experiences that I thought I would ever need to deal with. No. I had 18 months doing that job on the shop floor and that probably taught me the most about managing people, Mm. how to do it well, how not to do it well, Mm -hmm. the different contexts that people operated within and some really great practice and some really awful practice Mm. and real high pressure, fast moving consumer goods, you know, your wagon's coming at two o'clock and if the stuff isn't on it, it's not getting to the customer and and that whole commercial piece as well. So for me, it was a massive baptism of fire and some really joyful moments and some really awful moments. So being in the factory at like half past nine one evening when I should have been out on a date and um, yeah, uh, making the last basket of salmon and cucumber sandwiches. Can you imagine what that was like then going to the date? Oh, yes. You know, so <laughs> mm. they were Is just that some Chanel number five you're wearing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, Salmon and cucumber. <laughs> salmon number five and cucumber. <laughs> uh, it was just yeah and, and then Marxies have really high quality uh, things as yeah. well. Yeah. So mm. yeah. So so and, and actually for me that was brilliant. So it, working for a, a retailer who do have massively high quality standards mm. um and yeah, so so just learn a whole load and genuinely love the food manufacturing industry. It is an industry that doesn't get much um, doesn't get much exposure. We kind of just go into the shops and all this stuff is there and it's great. It's taken it's in, for granted. Yeah, it it's in packages. But actually, it, like when I took my mum at the end of my first week of work and I took her into the shop and said, "Mum, I made those sandwiches." Oh. It was just so brilliant. So yeah, so kind of that's where I learned a lot about that line management piece. Mm. And then uh, then I went into some projects. So on a graduate scheme, as you do, you kind of get, you do different things. So mm-hmm. I went into a project, we implemented SAP. So it was a company-wide um, initiative and it, this was my site. So I then started seeing different roles and different things, things that I'd never really thought about. Mm. Um, and then I went into the food science space. So actually, how do we design these sandwiches? How do we make sure that they meet all the technical specifications, all that sort of good stuff. Mm. Mm. Enjoyed that, just not really my cup of tea. Interesting though. Yeah, really interesting. Just I, yeah, it's just a bit too much detail mm. and not enough people. Yeah. Um, so then I was a project management project manager in um, the IT department in the, that function, setting up the structure to deliver against this ERP system we'd, we'd put in. So much more people are based, much more about behaviors. How do we get them to engage with this process? How do we do all that sort of stuff? So um, again, for me, it was always about the people and finding enough structure mm. Mm. without it like suffocating me. So yeah, so I did that. And then somebody kind of, as they do, tapped me on a, a kind of few different jobs in that tapped me on the shoulder and said hey do you fancy setting up the graduate scheme it's been paused for three years do you fancy having a go at that Mm. I was like oh I guess I could do Uh, previous to that I'd been in the center when we'd uh, we worked on a project to kind of divest half the business so I'd worked on the comms and I'd done all that bit so I'd done some really strategic change work with Mm. people and seen how that worked and figured out that directors are just people uh, (laughs) trying to have a really Mm -hmm. good go and do what they do Um, and they're people they're humans right Um, so went into the graduate scheme, set it up, kind of did a bit of learning as I went mm. um, and absolutely loved it. Just suddenly knew, oh my God, like 
well, how did I not know that this stuff existed in this way that I could actually do? And my parents or my dad was a teacher and I was never going to be a teacher. So I had, I'm never going to go to HR. I'd always stayed away from those things, bearing in mind, you know, I wanted to be an engineer. Mm. Um, and suddenly I find myself in this place where I go, oh, seriously, were you just being a bit like pig-headed before? <laughs> Cutting <laughs> off your nose is bite your face. Yeah, mm. you know, but actually then when I like work with people now, those experiences for me, I, I think that's something different that I bring is mm. that I have those experiences. I, you know, I have the warts and all stories and I and I really do appreciate how ch- challenging it can be. And also when you're talking to people who go, do you know what, I'm not great at the technical stuff, but I really want to lead, manage people. And then, but, but, but kind of in businesses and in organizations where you have to, somehow culturally we expect you to be technically expert <laughs> an expert yeah. and then we promote you to be a line manager which is a whole different set of skills and don't give any training well <laughs> yeah and and uh, uh, you're not always given that training or that support or even sometimes the choice mm. you know actually you're yeah this team yeah this is a natural progression for you yes. um and then there's somebody i had people skills i didn't necessarily have the technical skills mm. um so actually, as soon as I got into that more leadership and and um, kind of a broader role, actually, then I just that's when I started to fly. But I, you know, it's a real personal passion of mine about how you get those line managers. How do do they get an option? Do they feel like they have an option? Mm-hmm. How are our organisations set up and structured to enable them to really decide? Like, do I want to be this one or do I, I not? Yeah. It's crackers, isn't it? It's like if you want more money, you have to lead people. But mm-hmm. if you, you're not naturally inclined to lead people, it kind of sets people up to fail, isn't it? And it's the, it's the typical example of the best salesperson ends up managing the team, mm. Mm. even though that the, their strengths around the sales piece, their strengths aren't around the people management piece. piece mm. And, you know, and then they get told off for not um, <laughs> the team not working. Yeah. <laughs> it's like and, and yeah, and there's, there's a piece for me around if somebody wants to do it, Mm. And their motivation may not be for the good of humanity. It might be, actually, I want to do this because I want to progress. And mm. this is how I can progress. If they really want to do it and they believe that people are the way to do it, mm. I think you can give them the skills. You can give them the support and development to help them grow into that role. Mm. It's the people who go, actually, I want the money because this is what the money gives me mm. and don't really value it. Don't really think it's a worthwhile thing to do. Never enjoyed their one-to-ones. Mm. Never wanted to do one-to-ones for anybody else. Yeah. not bothered about people growing and developing <clears throat> yeah. and, and I'm not and like and if that's where you're at then that's cool just mm. stick with it just um the challenge is when people feel like they have to mm. kind of give lip service to something so that they mm. can develop and grow so yeah so I um just for our listeners, we do have a, we do have a dog in the room. So if you hear some funny noises, it's not James's to me. I've not gone to sleep or anything. <laughs> she's she's uh, Daisy is a bit of a character. She is quite a vocal staffy, <laughs> and uh, she has different little whines and moans for different things. And that was a please, can I go out in the sunshine? The challenge is that if I let her out in the sunshine, she'll be back at the door in two minutes <laughs> because it's too cold outside and windy, and she doesn't like the wind. <laughs> She's okay as long as I'm stroking her. We'll just, I'll yeah, just, I'll just, just placate her. Yeah, what's the word? <laughs> I'll just keep her out of trouble and you just keep talking. Uh, okay, so. Um, Is that, so with someone who's moving from a position of, let's say they've been a, a really good product manager or a line manager with technical capability, is it something, do you know, like with those, there's always this debate of is an entrepreneur born or are they, is that something that they pick up with time? Is it the same thing for someone who moves into a position further up the hierarchy where you can actually train somebody to be good at managing people? Or is it something more innate? Or is it linking back to the general interest in actually doing that and moving mm-hmm. away from what they've done previously? So I guess for me personally, I like to believe that if somebody genuinely wants to do something, mm-hmm. they can do it. They will because they will naturally go and find the resources, the training, the whatever it is to make that happen. Um, I do think that some people are are more comfortable and more natural in that space, leading mm. people. Like uh, they are more genuine. They they kind of genuinely interested in people. They have those things in them, which probably make it just a little bit easier for them to get into that space. Mm-hmm. I think the further up you go, um, that kind of uh, kind of center of creative leadership, vertical and horizontal piece development around how do you, you there does get to a point where the skills are not enough 
you have to actually go and have those really hot like heated experiences where success or failure can happen Mm -hmm. and where you've got a coach or some support to then talk about what am I going to do in this situation you've got other people you can go and gather their thoughts and perspectives Mm -hmm. because it's real right and you can do something with it and then you make sense of it and then you do something so Mm -hmm. that bit about developing more complexity as you grow up kind of up the in seniority that complexity for me again you can learn how to do it mm-hmm. it's just um quite often it happens by happen chance or it doesn't happen by happen chance and suddenly you have leaders in the business who we're talking about performance management managing them or are they really the right fit now and nobody's actually just stopped and gone have we as a business supported them to do that mm-hmm. sometimes it's absolutely legitimate you know what? they're not the right person in the job mm. let's cut to the chase and sort it out um just for me sometimes there's a have we really helped them with the support they need to make sense of these different situations and these different experiences Mm -hmm. to grow their ability to think in a more complex way and to think about people and Mm -hmm. just do that more kind of strategic piece Mm. and i think there's a massive difference between leadership and management as well Mm. and so some people are really good managers are terrible leaders and the opposite way around so it's it's almost sort of figuring out where your strengths lie to Mm. Um, and 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 then figure out how to sort of mitigate your impact in the other areas that you're not so good at. Yeah, and uh, I've run a program um, for a, a, a client where I actually work with people who think they might want to be leaders, and you give them like four days of intensive, like, who are you? Mm-hmm. What does drive you? What are your values? What are your beliefs? Um, what to your point about managing and leading what does that actually mean so what are my things I'm going to have to let go of Mm -hmm. so I'm not going to be able to be in the technical stuff every minute of every day which is where I am like a pig in you know (laughs) yeah I'm gonna have to actually take a step out of that and do some different thinking about things Mm -hmm. and and think about my people and how am I developing my people how am I developing myself to be able to develop my people Mm -hmm. um and are you okay with that is that comfortable you know, can you collaborate with other people? Mm-hmm. Can you, uh, have you got capacity? Are, y- are you able to manage your time even? Not that you can manage time, but you know what I mean? Mm. C- are you going to carve up time? Are you going to allocate time to do this people management activity? Because it is, you know, different. <laughs> Sorry, we're giggling because yeah. your dog is very needy. <laughs> <laughs> she, she Normally she sleeps, when I sit here, she sleeps next to the window. She just absolutely zonko from like, Whenever to start to whenever I finish. It's just people. You have this magnetic attraction. I'll just stroke her. She's fine. <laughs> so what came after the sandwiches? Oh, so so I did that. Uh, so the graduate scheme. And then I worked. So then I figured out that actually I quite like to do that. And I had some pretty hardcore, brilliant mentors at that point in my life who were telling me things about myself that I had no idea about, Mm. that I still now every so often go, oh Oh, yeah, 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 Beverly told me that when I was like 27. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she was saying that I really like to get stuff done and complete objectives and do work. Mm. And I've always gone, no, no, do you know what, I don't know about that. And she's like, no, you really do. And now I look at my to-do list on my table and it's all crossed off and I am very happy. Yeah. (laughs) So there's some it's things. Almost sometimes you're just not ready to hear the stuff. That some feedback that you get. Yeah. So like, we'll just put that in. A, we'll put that in a drawer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For yeah. Now. Yeah. Until you're ready to accept it. Yeah. And um, so then, I, and, and as part of that kind of a, in that business, um, I got the opportunity to do my NLP practitioner, mm. and then I went and did my pr- master practitioner. And um, there's a massive of uh, there's massive differing opinions about whether it's great or whether it's like some voodoo crazy stuff Mm -hmm. um i would say that uh the way that i learned it and the person that i was trained by um very high level of ethics and uh, integrity she's just now actually kicking off the first proper study about using nlp for ptsd sufferers Mm. to help them uh, kind of recover and manage that situation um in the university of dublin so she's in her field she is the person to do this stuff so i've always found it really useful i always use it with a high level integrity myself um and it has helped me to think about who i am how i operate what's possible just some really good stuff that connected with me naturally i guess yeah no i had a 
I had an interesting experience with a procurement manager at an organization I used to work in um, who used to go around telling everyone, I know how to manipulate people. It's like, because yeah. I done NLP. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It's like, you've obviously not learned anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> about NLP. If you think it's about manipulating people, you've got it wrong. Well, and that's, and that's how you communicate people as well. I can manipulate yeah. you to do everything I want. It's like, no. <laughs> No, and actually when he started, I was able to cut a little bit off his salary because he was, uh, uh, yeah, I was able to <laughs> out-negotiate him. So yeah, you're not, not that good. <laughs> you can no. manipulate me. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I just, I think it's a, it's fascinating. And I've since, kind of one of my big milestones was to run a program myself. So I then have worked with um, Lisa mm-hmm. and uh, we ran uh, an open program last year and it was probably like one of my most favorite mm-hmm. things to do mm. and also one of those gut-wrenching moments of oh my god I'm stepping out the plane you know h- how do I do this stuff but what mm-hmm. what I've really noticed I'm sorry my dog is just so noisy <laughs> um, <laughs> what I've really noticed is that actually what I bring is a real pragmatic she's just singing she's just being disruptive <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I've really noticed is that I've been quite a pragmatic pr- approach to taking this learning mm-hmm. stuff and how does it actually live and breathe in the workplace. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love theory if I can use it. I love learning when mm-hmm. I can apply it. Mm-hmm. I really enjoy, you know, so, um, and again, that's a gentle tension when you're doing a job, you know, as a consultant because there's an expectation that you'll be the expert. Mm-hmm. Um, and also f- for me, I might know lots of stuff and it really is for me about how do you shape it and fit it for those Mm. particular contexts? How do you help the learning to come out with that particular individual? It might be different. Mm -hmm. And hey, do you know what? I might not actually even be the person who's really going to make that sing for that person. So um, there's, you kind of have to go with a lot of uh, pragmatic pragmatism and just sensibleness when it kind of you're thinking about that learning and how you apply it, I think. No, it's really interesting what you said because we've done a bit of work together and we were you know we were given we did some coaching and we were given the people that would be able to help the most that would fit into our personality so it's really interesting that that you know that the organization actually took it upon themselves to assess us in comparison to yeah um, yeah. and our, on our ways of working so yeah. it's really interesting Michelle your style would work with this person because <laughs> you're just going <laughs> to tell them and be clear and just give it hot strong <laughs> Naomi you probably uh, work better with this person a bit gentler. <laughs> yeah they probably need a bit more space just to um, kind of talk about stuff and I think that's and I think you have to know yourself and you have to be really clear with mm. that and pretty comfortable and confident that um, like I only want to support people to make the changes that they want to make. Yeah. So if they don't want to make changes as a business, as an organization, as a person, then you that's cool with me. You can't, you can't do exactly. You yeah. can't do it. Um, and also if I'm not the right person, then I'm still not going to help them deliver that. I'm not no. going to help them do that. It needs so to be a fit. It does. So what, what drove you into the world of self-employment? Because it's not, an, you know, obviously you've got the, that slight rebellious streak. But it's, it's, I love know. that you call it that. I've never been a rebel, but I love that. You are. It's yes. a little bit of rebellion. Yes. yes. Um, so what, what, what pushed you into or what pulled you into entrepreneurship? Well, so for me, there has always been something about I love to make decisions. I like to make stuff happen. I like to get in there. Um, and and particularly when I'm going, do you know what? I can see how I can support this mm. project. I can see how we can deliver something really awesome in this space. Um, you know, I, I, I've worked in corporate businesses where, you know, because of the way they are structured, actually the decision making can be, a little bit less than quick <laughs> um yeah political bureaucratic uh, yeah and lengthy. and yeah mm. and in and in you know and and at different po- points in those in my career i have had different um interactions with how difficult that has been to whereas how it, good it can be mm. uh, and also i just want to make some decisions mm. i wanted to make some decisions because i knew that i had more to offer and more to give that i just wasn't able to do in that space mm. um now, I was never going to do this. I was never going to set up my own business and do this sort of stuff. I mean, because, you know. It's bonkers. It's bonkers and it's <laughs> risky and it's all those sorts of things. And, and um, you know, I, uh, my husband is brilliant in terms of like his appetite for risk is very different than mine. Mm. And his just belief and his uh, kind of, well, good question. So he did NLP with me and... Mm-hmm he sometimes just asks those questions that go right to the heart and you go, yeah, okay, I just need to get on with this. Mm. Um, and so that decision-making 
and learning. I wasn't learning anything where I was. I was really struggling with the context. And as happens quite nicely sometimes, somebody said, oh, here's a restructure. Your role's not in the structure. Oh. It's a sign. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's it, you know. Friday Mm -hmm. afternoon, sat in a car park on the phone, thinking, oh, dear. (laughs) And a month later, I was doing this. So um, a bit of push and a bit of pull. Mm. uh, And some of the things I have absolutely delighted in as I look at you two across the table is that one of my kind of real hesitations about kind of setting up my own business was how lonely would it be? Mm. I love people. I like people. And actually... I do great pieces of work with lots of different people. Mm. Um, I run apprenticeships with Angela, who recruited me in as a graduate years and years ago. So I, I, I have a really good network. And what I also really like is the genuine collaborative nature mm. of people who are entrepreneurs who are doing this great stuff mm. in whatever field. They just actually want to give you a hand. And, it's, and I find that, you know, the competitiveness that I had experienced, particularly in my last space, mm. had vanished. Mm. So I just love yeah, that. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I'm I'm on a bit of a, a Sean Aker uh, journey at the moment, literally reading everything he's ever done. And he talks about this um, a little potential and big potential. And it's the big, you know, getting the best out of people is that collaboration piece, mm. 100%, yeah. you know, and there is enough for everybody. Yeah, and mm. I definitely operate from that belief. Mm-hmm. And collaboration for me is like we talk about it lots I talk about lots of businesses I work with and I, and there is something about how do I role model that how do mm. I get into that and I found that quite straightforward like in our kind of industry in our area mm. no it is there's so many nice it's almost for me is that there's too many people I want to collaborate yes. with yes mm. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's like there's so many good people that we could do stuff with yeah. it's almost like prioritizing and just doing one thing at a time which mm. I'm not very good at yeah, and also I think there's something about like also being so as a con- as a consultant who is building expertise and building those expertise all the time. For me, there is also something about how am I working with people who are genuinely going to give me the feedback mm. and who are genuinely going to stretch my thinking and stretch my learning. Mm. Um, which you know, as you've heard, like I've done a lot of different jobs in different functions, yeah. and it's always been driven by right. I've learned this bit, and I'm. I can do this bit. Mm -hmm. It isn't quite making me sing, but I kind of feel like I've done my thing. What else Mm -hmm. can I learn somewhere else? Mm. One of the things when I, when I set kind of stepped into the business was, okay, so how am I going to learn? What can I do? And so I joined the uh, entrepreneurial spark as it was at the time to learn about how you like, how do you build a business? What do Mm. you do with that? And that's fascinating. And I really enjoy that. I love doing my accounts. I love doing, I know, it's I did, I generally face. <laughs> <laughs> um I, and I love learning all about those sort of areas um and also thinking about kind of much more strategically about how you plan your business and what you really want to focus on and and how you really want that to work mm. uh, and also you know not letting the politics or the thoughts or the ideas of other people necessarily just guide you into you've got to grow 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 or um got to diversify or did a little actually for me I've just you know I'm three years in and I am still loving it mm-hmm. and still know that there's flex and there will be change and exciting adventures to come so kind of also for me a bit of you know having worked in a corporate situation where I felt like I had very little power and influence like keeping that mm. and really enjoying it and really stepping into it again has been another kind of another good lesson for me excellent so tell us a little bit about the business okay so uh i do kind of three different areas so i have clients of my own Mm -hmm. direct clients that i work with um uh, a variety in different kind of industries i really enjoy working with uh, those kind of different in those different spaces Mm. Um, typically quite pragmatic businesses i seem to attract or seem to enjoy working with um who want to do some stuff mm. uh so really nice space to work in there um and i do some associate work so again i get opportunities to go and work with other businesses that mm. i wouldn't necessarily do mm. um so uh, my favorite piece of work at the moment is working with a kind of a, a setting up an office space and thinking about the culture of that space mm. and how do the team do some stuff genuinely different mm. in that space so that's 
really interesting and I really enjoy that piece of work. Um, and then I have a, kind of the other third of my business is focused on apprenticeships. So I am level three and level five apprenticeships mm. with people who are in the business. So all those lovely people who I've talked about who mm. are managing people without actually having perhaps any mm. or very minimal mm-hmm. skills uh, kind of supported and given to them by their businesses. Do you know what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you know what you could do next? Could you just cover her with a blanket? <laughs> you know, she's got her eyes open, but still snoring. She's still snoring. She snores with her eyes open. <laughs> <It's> like, <clears throat> uh, so, talking about the apprenticeships. skills of those higher up who move into yes. senior positions that links to apprenticeships. Yes. Because yeah. the common misconception with apprenticeships is it's for the young'uns yep. under 18s but I think that's what's great about them now is mm. it op- offers companies opportunities to develop yeah. their staff and you can be as as old as you need to be as old as you like really to do something can't you so mm. I am working with a learner who is in his um, early 50s mm-hmm. and uh, he you know again pragmatic business he has worked his way up through he's got all his technical qualifications so he was health and safety by trade he's got those pieces never done anything in leadership and management um and he is working through this uh, level five apprenticeship with us and i mean he is awesome he is you know very committed and very focused on the learning and going and using this stuff in his role because the other thing so about the the apprenticeship levy whether you think it's good bad or awful Mm -hmm. um there are some really, from from my perspective, there are some awesome opportunities in there. So, you know, you've got a pot of money that you're going to have to spend on developing people. Mm-hmm. So, like, use it wisely. Mm-hmm. Think about what you're going to do with it. That's good. Yeah? Um, and from my perspective, uh, there is no way I could go into any business and say, I tell you what, could you give me about 20% of everybody's week to really focus on developing and learning their skills in leadership and management? Mm. Nobody would say yes. They would just mm-hmm. go, huh, no. <laughs> you know, yeah. but actually, you've got a real opportunity as a business mm-hmm. to have people who are already in your business to really grow and develop. Yeah. Because yes. um, if, if you say you will lose this money, yeah. So well, why not you, do something with you're it? You're paying it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And and what I would say though is that it isn't like if people are just using it so they don't lose it. Mm-hmm. It is really hard work, and from a provider perspective. So um, I wouldn't work with somebody who's just going, Do you know, I just need to spend it. What, what can you help me spend it on? Mm. Yes. Because for me, if it only really sticks and it only really works for the learners if it is in, weaved into their strategy. So what do they want to develop? How do they want to grow? Mm. Um, I work uh, in a where, kind of warehousing um, logistics business and they have got lots of, I don't really want to mention the word Brexit, but Mm -hmm. they have got lots of people who have been over here for some time Mm -hmm. who have degrees in crazy things, you know, like one of the people I'm working with is, uh, has got a a biology degree. She's bright. She gets it. She Mm -hmm. really wants to learn how to do things. And she's in that mindset to do things well, but actually Mm -hmm. she's now managing a team of quality people and a continuous improvement team. Mm -hmm. And she wants to know the skills and how do I do that? Mm -hmm. So for that business, it's, it's growing their internal skills. It's supporting their retention. Mm. And for me, it's always that really lovely creative challenge of how can we make this fit and work in your context? Mm-hmm. So some providers do it all e-learning and you just have an assessor who comes on site once a month and a quick chat, you know. But actually, for me, there is a real benefit in tailoring and making sure that there's in, there's face-to-face workshops, there's study days, there's definitely online learning, there's independent study, there's in the on the job so you know you've been doing pdrs for the last four years this way we've taught you and you've kind of understood about different people's preferences and how you might be able to communicate with them differently Mm. so then you go and do your pdr with that new learning and really embed it and hey you're learning Mm -hmm. and that qualify that kind of works in your qualification that is part Mm. of your learning that is part of that 20 percent so there's definitely ways it can work if a business wants to, and if they can see how it sh- kind of ties in with their strategy, with the, the, the culture that they want to develop, really. Mm-hmm. And I was a big believer, if you're having fun, you're learning. And with all those different approaches, you know, it'll be fun. Some bits will be fun, some bits will be painful. But yep. as long as it's overall fun. Yeah. Then and, and again, so we also use... Um, so we're always a massive experiential learning is really core cool to kind of how we do our designed and, and delivered our apprenticeship. So mm. I, I'm 
kind of acknowledging my colleague Angela who isn't sat with me now but <laughs> if she was she'd be saying the same thing so we use some great tools and some great activities that um you know like you <laughs> the tower of power mm. how do you build the blocks together to actually look at the behavioral elements of how you work together how do you lead the team how do you achieve things what was your plan what were your goals so we get them to do some fun activities mm. that are low risk that build trust in that team build that network and that they can go out and go okay this isn't a tower perfect activity but what we need to do is get all this stuff out on the wagons mm. in this order and i've got these restrictions and these resource challenges you know so i like this tower of power what is this <laughs> <laughs> can we implement it <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant you have like a crane and you can't touch the blocks and you have to build it as high as you can oh, it's brilliant so cool <laughs> i would be having lots of fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so we use a real we use a real mix uh -huh. and also um we it also really it's also really challenged me to think about things like um working with people who have kind of more specialist educational needs like um dyslexia or dyspraxia mm -hmm. also people whose english isn't the first language so and in a real variety of roles and also go through the rigor of um offset inspections and esfa audits and all that good stuff mm. <sighs> that actually brings a lot of rigor to how you spend that money so you know and, and i think that some businesses are just it might be fits in the too difficult box or they don't understand and that for me is a real shame because they could really be utilizing something to develop and support the people who are in their business who they probably want to keep mm. who they probably haven't got a massive budget left mm. anymore to develop it just takes a bit of it just takes some commitment and some thinking about so if an organization was thinking you know we, we are spending this money but we don't really know what to do with it so having even chat yeah with, with you absolutely just to say you know what what um what can i do what am i allowed to do what could we do what mm. what would yeah what would help you know and and what i would say is um, so my area of, is very about that kind of leadership and management space. But, it, you know, I think the other provisions of kind of your more technical skills are pretty well mm. and are, are more understood. But also we can kind of talk to you about where you might go to for some of those things. Yeah. So for me, if you've got a levy, thinking about how you use that strategically mm. rather than just I've got this pot of money. Yes. I really want to do something with it before somebody takes it off mm. me. Mm. Um, you know, just... People might not even know that these these things exist, I guess. Mm. So yeah, very happy to talk to anybody, even just on a, you know, tell me more about the apprenticeship levy. I'm quite passionate about it, as you can hear. Mm. You mentioned a bit before, so with apprenticeships, developing people, I presume that would open doors to coaching type conversations as mm -hmm. well. So definitely other areas around coaching, kind of specifically coaching individuals. Mm -hmm and also kind of coaching teams and working with teams mm -hmm. so working with them to get them really motoring uh, on that kind of high challenge high support piece so whilst i am maybe not as direct in my coaching mm -hmm. as michelle mm -hmm. uh, i am challenging in a, in a different way in terms of actually really finding what's the crux of the matter and how do we really get under the the kind of what is that thing that's mm. causing the issue mm. and that can work just as well for individuals as it can work for teams so you know i mentioned briefly about the, the culture setting up that mm -hmm. culture of that office now actually that office is a building with bricks and mortar and it's the people within it that are really key so mm -hmm. helping them to really build relationships really challenge each other mm -hmm. really support each other call out what are the challenges what are the things that i really need help with what what am I doing that's really getting in the way? Mm -hmm. And really building some really robust relationships that then means they can go and deliver their operational stuff. Mm -hmm. That again for me is real a real passion mm -hmm. and where I really like to work because like relationships are so important and building trust and doing that is really so important. And again, um, we kind of go, do you know what? That's just one of those things that just happens, doesn't it, right? Like mm -hmm. I either get on with somebody or I don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's a bit much, a bit more to it than that, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> Yeah. And so. yeah. And do you want to get on with them? Is there a purpose? Have you agreed some stuff? Have you actually surfaced and talked about, this is a story I'm running in my head about you. Mm. Um, this is what I'm actually saying about me right now mm -hmm. in this context that is getting in the way of me really being my best mm -hmm. and doing the stuff that I really do and bringing what I can bring to this team. So um, 
you know, those sorts of pieces of work are brilliant. And my favorite pieces of work with clients, um, with a client, this particular client I'm thinking about is come and help us with this setup. And by the way, let us know what you think might also help. So not just a, can you come in and do a two day this and that on, mm-hmm. um, actually genuinely partnering with a business to figure mm-hmm. out in your context, which again is really important to me, um, in your context, what's really going to work, mm-hmm. what's happened before, what do you want, where do you want to get to, what are some of the things you haven't thought about yet? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's when, it's when clients come to you and say, I want this in a box and you go, mm, that's probably not what you need, <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. that kind of balancing the no, you're wrong and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. with the maybe we should try this. Have you thought about trying this? Yeah. I really struggle with that piece. Yeah. I'm thinking, oh, no, that's definitely not what you need. But it's having that conversation to say, <laughs> tell me more about <laughs> that situation <laughs> and what is it that's got you to this point? Yeah. And yeah, and what really is it that you really want to be different? Because yeah. is it really that? Yeah. And and what and also what have you got capacity, budget, scope for? What mm. is in the culture? Like how ambitious are you? Um all of those good things that then you can kind of put into a mix of, right, okay, so let's mm. really think about what we're going to do here. Be s- like thoughtful about that and planful because yeah. there is nothing worse than come and do a time management course and then nothing changes or a time, uh, yeah. time I've management been on, is a whole different thing, isn't it? I've been on a lot of time management courses and the fact that I've got technology that can do that for me, it's like it's almost... Time management doesn't need to be a worry in anyone's life, really. You've got you've got things that can help. You have tools. And there's tools, yes. Yeah. yeah. You need to want to be good at time management. <laughs> you do. <laughs> and that, for me, is the whole thing. You know, there are a lot... I will... Again, I was working with a coach uh, recently, and I found a very great number of ways to ask that individual, what do you want? Do you want this? What do you want? You know, is this serving you? Uh, what else could you be doing what Mm. else are you thinking tell me about that situation in terms of what what were you thinking and feeling on the inside lots of different ways of getting them to really think about what is really driving me to do these behaviors to be in this business to Mm. do this this way because until you decide or discover why you want to do something why you want to change something then I'm like why would you do anything else particularly when you're working with really senior leaders who mm. have been successful, who have got to where they've got to, doing what they've done, and and I'm massively respectful of that achievement and that, and also there's still a real you have to keep evolving and mm. and growing. It's that is my so thing. important. Yeah, because you know the world is changing at such a rate. <laughs> you you can't be good at everything. So recognizing that need to develop and the mm. need to keep growing and need to learn new stuff. You know you you probably so much better than other people when you do that mm. you know and, and, and the being okay with that you know I, if it, during the 80s this worked so it's going to work now it's like <laughs> mm, it's not though is it <laughs> but and also and also as senior leaders like th- they they've been successful and they've got to where they've got to and there's also a bit about being um just aware of the vulnerability and the challenge that that can be mm. in in actually saying do you know what I'm really struggling with this or I just don't know what to do mm-hmm. um or I've this has been okay for ages and now I'm really struggling mm. and uh, particularly with all the focus on mental health and well-being y- everybody needs a bit of support and an opportunity to grow and develop in whichever way that they would like to mm. that works with them mm-hmm. um uh, they just have to want to mm-hmm. and uh Sometimes they, you know, they can just figure it out and do mm. it on their own. Awesome. Sometimes they need a bit of support. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and it's about finding the right way to do that and, yeah, who and how and all that good stuff. That's awesome. We are now going to be moving along to the quick fire <sighs> round, which has not yet been named, <laughs> which I think is probably the name of the quick fire yeah. round. Yeah, just call it quick fire. <laughs> <laughs> I think, no, the quick <clears> fire <throat> round that hasn't been named. Yeah. I think that's the name of it. <laughs> So, James, would you like to take it away with the first question? Question number one. What chore do you absolutely hate doing? Oh, my God, that's such a good question. (laughs) This will make my other half really laugh. I really hate emptying the little caddy that sits on the side that has all the composty bits and pieces Mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. I just really hate emptying it. <laughs> like th- we've moved the compost bin so it's right near the door so there's no efficiency reason why I shouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. I'm I 
I am absolutely looking for different ways to save the planet so that my stepdaughter can still have a nice place to live. Mm. And I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. I just hate doing it. And then you have to wash the thing up afterwards because I can't put it back dirty because, yeah, loathe it. <laughs> but we salute you for doing it yes, anyway. Thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thanks. The planet thanks you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do question two because Michelle's really keen to ask the last question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you were home on a rainy Sunday afternoon, mm. what movie would you want to see on television? Oh, so... Um, I'd like to say that it was something really cool, but it would probably be a, a massive love of the classics. So it would probably like a triple bill of Emma, mm-hmm. Mansfield mm-hmm. Park, and Pride mm-hmm. and Prejudice. Oh, yeah. okay. You know, like Sunny, just because they're comfortable, you know that they're going to have a happy ending. Mm. You know, they really, yeah. Oh, well, there's so many different versions of Pride and Prejudice. So you're definitely going for the Colin Firth one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just checking <laughs> it's very important to know it is and also because it's longer yeah. it's a real commitment it's a whole afternoon <laughs> dedicated yeah. viewing isn't it yes. <laughs> if it's going to be a rainy day i'm going to make sure i fill this yes with but essential do, viewing do you know what though it's really really interesting though on a sunday afternoon i would really struggle to like i would struggle to sit still mm-hmm. i like a good mooch about once every six months but i would probably be doing like hobbies and mm-hmm. cooking and baking and stained glass windowing and achieving lino stuff. cutting and mm. well you know just <laughs> making practical creation i like that whole yeah yeah <laughs> i like the the tangible creation of stuff i love it okay that wasn't very quick fire was it so no it's fine so this is a question that i've literally been dying to ask somebody <laughs> oh, um, God. and then i thought we've got enough of a rapport <laughs> and also you'll forgive me for asking <laughs> you it <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> so if you could wedgie any historical <laughs> figure who would it be? <laughs> Who would it be? <laughs> oh my god, that is some question. <laughs> Who would I wedgie? I, I'm, I was going for a very practical note there. I went to like some of the kings and queens of England, but mm-hmm. thought that they would have too many garments to wedgie. It's, that's not an efficient. <laughs> that's not an easy one to do, is it really? So then I went to like the Romans, and mm-hmm. a, you know. Maybe that would be quite fun. Um, <laughs> but they didn't have pants on, did they? they <laughs> no, exactly. Dresses. It would have been difficult to wedgie them. <laughs> would have been this is an interesting when you ask this to a very pragmatic person. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm just trying to think. I know. I would really like to wedgie Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> I know she's not really very historical. <laughs> but, you know, actually just because, A, you could get to her. Yeah. Um, and B, I don't think she'd mind. <laughs> I think she'd be pretty cool with that. And you could also say, I have wedged Madonna. That yeah. would be quite funky, wouldn't it? It would be, yeah. Excellent. That's a bit random. You could have a t-shirt range. You could. <laughs> <laughs> I wedged it's Madonna. The merchandise possibilities are endless. <laughs> that is the most random question that I have ever been asked. Excellent. Oh, interesting answer. <laughs> no, I have been saving it for somebody who would forgive me mm. for ans- asking it. So thank you very much <laughs> for letting me. Always happy to enable somebody else's growth, Michelle. <laughs> problem is now Naomi's going to be on the blacklist for <laughs> any Madonna public events yeah. or concerts or strike her off the list <laughs> no no she would wedge you me <laughs> oh, she, I don't think she would mind I don't think she would mind no she'd she'd, she'd be slightly bemused about it I yeah. think yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Madonna was the answer to one of my questions on my podcast as well oh really yeah interesting there you go so the final question we ask all of our guests is um if you could get in your time machine and go back to your 18-year-old self and sit down and have a, a cuppa with her, what would you say to her? I would tell her a few things. Mm-hmm. Uh, firstly, to just like relax a bit. That life is going to be okay. Just relax, just chill out mm-hmm. um, and enjoy the moment. That's my dog It's snoring. perfect with the dog snoring in the background. Yeah, I'm like, so sorry. Chill out like Daisy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got such sorted. some really cute photos over there. <laughs> it's grand. Uh, so um, I would definitely say chill out, relax, uh, enjoy it, actually suck it up, enjoy it. Mm. I would also just tell myself to be more me, mm. like start earlier being more me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would also say I, would no, I wouldn't change the route that I've taken to to get here. What I would say is just be okay with that because there were definitely times where I kind of felt like oh, everybody else has got a flipping career plan and a path and I, they know exactly where they're going mm-hmm. and that 
cause me some like angst whereas actually I just again I would just go do those really be in those moments and get all you can learn all you can and enjoy the learning and kind of sometimes I'd probably find myself worrying a bit too much about where I was going next Mm -hmm. rather than what I was doing there and then or that somehow it wasn't the classic career path that everybody else should you know is doing Mm -hmm. which now I know nobody really does no so yeah that would be my that would be it Mm. awesome thank you yeah oh and uh, grow out your fringe grow your fringe (laughs) 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 I think we've all been there (laughs) 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 I love it so if that's of interest to our listeners what's the best way to find you Uh, so I'm on LinkedIn Mm -hmm. Uh, there is also we also have a website so uh, mainly consulting mayoni consulting.com and I can provide you with my email so you can just email me directly it's a bit of a mouthful but it's much easier to see (laughs) in the show notes (laughs) yeah Yeah. awesome well thank you Mm. ever so much for inviting us into your beautiful home and let us stroke your dog (laughs) (laughs) I really am sorry she is such a snorer she (laughs) we can't have her in the caravan with us or anywhere close to her on holiday because you can't sleep through this snoring (laughs) that was fine we used to live next to the east coast mainline we sleep through anything (laughs) (laughs) brilliant thank you very much guys thanks Thank thank you thanks Thanks everyone for listening. Check out all the show notes at inspirationnorth.com. Join us again for the next episode when we'll be chatting to another inspirational person. If you like this, subscribe and tell your friends. If you didn't like this, subscribe anyway and tell everybody.